Welcome everybody and thank you for joining today's RTA webinar, um, which is a recap of the range of law reforms for Queensland from 2021 up until now in 2023. Our team members today have a wealth of experience with tenancy laws and processes and we're here to help you be informed. I'd like to introduce our team today. Um, we have Sam Gaylor, um, he's our Principal Project Officer who's been part of the Rental Law Implementation Project team and been with the RTA for over 10 years in various customer service roles and leadership teams. So welcome today, Sam. Thanks, Lynn. Morning, everyone. We also have Mark Fiddler from our Communication and Education team. Mark's been with the RTA for 18 years and in our Customer Experience team, our support and now in education. So Mark will be assisting behind the scenes today and also helping with facilitating our Q&A session. So thanks, Mark. Thanks, Lynn. Welcome along, everyone. And my name is Lynn Smith and I'm a Senior Community Education Officer and I've been with the RTA for over 18 years in various roles, um, our Dispute Resolution Service, Education and recently with Sam in the Rental Law Implementation Project team. Now, if you have any questions today um, along the way, please submit them with the chat function that you'll find on your Zoom toolbar. Um, it's a little speech bubble. We want to hear from you and do appreciate your time in joining us today. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we are hosting today's webinar and where you are joining us as well and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So for today's session, it's recapping those rental law reforms that have come in since 2021 and where you can find in-depth resources to help you gain a better understanding of these changes and what is now part of Queensland tenancy laws. We also want to talk to you about um, the, what was what is consulted on um, and what's on the horizon for stage two reforms as well. We will do a QA and a at the end, but um, if you have specific questions relating to topics as we progress, please do pop them in that chat, that little speech bubble, um, and Mark will keep an eye on that. And if we have time throughout the session, we'll um, look at answering those as we go. Our aim is to give you an overview of these changes and address some of the more topical questions that we've received. Received. Um, you may have actually submitted some questions as part of your registration, so we want to make sure that we look at addressing those as well and making sure too that you know where to find information to get more in-depth information on our website. Sam, Mark and I are not here to give you legal advice and as always we refer you to the Act um, or to get independent advice. So just a quick slide to advise you of our role. The RTA's core function is to administer Queensland's tenancy laws, the Residential Tenancies and Roomy Accommodation Act 2008. We don't make the rules, but we know and understand the rules and our role is to help you and everybody involved in a tenancy. So it's landlords, it's agents, it's managers, providers, tenants and residents to understand their rights and obligations and how these rules apply. And a big shout out, we've got um, everyone involved in that tenancy sector in our webinar today. And we also have people not just in South East Queensland, but right across the whole of Queensland in um, our webinar. We are an independent statutory authority and our services have our, we have our call centre um, that's available Monday to Friday, predominantly provides guidance on bonds and your tenancy queries. Um, our education, our outreach events, including presentations and information sessions, as well as the webinars and podcasts, and also a variety of other resources that you'll find on our website. These channels do help us increase community awareness of tenancy rights and responsibilities. We also do offer a free dispute resolution service to help parties try and help resolve those tenancy or bond issues that might occur, and either party can lodge a dispute request with the RTA. We do drive compliance of the Act through education and enforcement activities from our investigations team. And as you would be aware, the RTA holds the bonds for residential tenancies across Queensland. So just a quick history here for the rental reforms and how we actually got here. So it did kick off back in 2018 to 19, which was the Queensland Government's Open Doors to Renting Reform consultation. The Housing Legislation Amendment Act 2021 was passed in October 21 and was implemented in a staged approach. So the first of the stages was the domestic and family violence provisions. Then we had last year in October, the framework for negotiating renting with a pet, 
changes to the reasons for ending a tenancy, repair orders and other amendments that were introduced. And the final part of stage one, and that's one September this year in 2023, the minimum housing standards for new tenancies and for all tenancies will be the following year in 2024. So what's next is stage two, and we'll talk about that at the end of the session. So we'll start with the overview of the domestic and family violence provisions and just to summarise what these provisions are and they have been in place now since October 21. So a tenant experiencing domestic and family violence can end their interest in the tenancy, whether they're the sole tenant or they could be a co-tenant. They can request their bond contribution to be refunded if they did pay a rental bond. Um, they are not liable for rental costs, oh sorry, reletting costs, whether they're ending a periodic or a fixed term tenancy or any damage that's caused by the act of DFE against them. So if someone does submit a notice to end their interest, they do need to provide or show evidence, uh, whether that's a DFE report, which can be completed by an authorised professional, or it could be a police protection order. So there is information um, on what is supporting evidence options that's on our website. They can, change, they can choose to stay in the rental property and change those locks to ensure their safety. Now, if the locks are changed, then a copy still does need to be given to the managers or the owner, um, and as soon as it's practical to do so. There is a, rest, a strict process to follow with the remaining tenants, and the RTA has a fantastic flow chart that's available to help you understand the timings and also that process. What I might do, Mark, I might get you to put a link in the chat function for everyone, if that's okay, for our DFE resources. Um, there are, it is a confidential provision. There is confidential provisions in the legislation regarding the domestic and family violence provisions and also too with the person leaving the property. So this does come with penalty provisions so that if a penalty point, sorry, that if you do breach that, so it is quite serious. As I said, all the forms, flow charts, fact sheets, there's also a helpline information that you'll find on our website as well. And Mark, thanks for putting that information in the chat. What I want to do, Sam, if I can get you to come in. Um, we did get a few questions um, leading up to our webinar um, when people registered about domestic and family violence and a couple of them actually do link into the impacts for landlords as such. So Sam it wasn't quite clear whether it's like the damage or potential rent arrears or about the ending of the tenancy. So what options do landlords have? You know, can they chase the person who's caused damage or who pays for those rent arrears? You're muted. I'm still muted. Don't you love There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, look, it is it is a challenging situation. Obviously, the the priority and the you know the intent of the legislation is very much around the person suffering domestic and family violence being protected and given every opportunity to be able to leave the property um, or stay if it's safe to do so. Um, you mentioned about confidentiality. When it comes to um, costs that the the owner needs to try and uh, and recover. At the end, um, you're not able to um, to pursue the uh, tenant who's experienced domestic and family violence. So for any damage um, that has been caused to the property, for instance, as a result of um, of DFB, and look, that can be that can be really hard to determine. Um, but ultimately, there's always the ability to pursue if if the perpetrator was uh, was also a tenant, they are someone that you could uh, that you could still um, issue the the bill to or or try and recover those costs um, otherwise we'd probably be looking at um you know maybe a a, a civil matter um, and we'd encourage you to seek uh, independent legal advice in those situations sure uh, now Veronica's just asked a quick question in relation to body corporate master key systems and changing of locks and you know this does fall with um, body corporate legislation not necessarily the RTA's mm -hmm. legislation in that regard and you know and it comes down to obviously whether we're talking about the actual lock to a door or whether there's still like another level of security to a building or to a complex and things like that so um, it really comes down to to probably having a conversation too with the individual body corporate um, about whether or not 
that particular lock can be changed because if there is a master system, um, yeah, they can just change the barrel inside um, someone's door. Um, so again, yeah, talking to your individual body corporate might also help in that regard. Thanks, Veronica, for that question too. Okay, so the next slide or the next part is the 2022 changes that started off with pets. Um, so the RTA doesn't regulate the rules for the prospective tenant application or the selection process. So the laws in place apply for existing tenancies. So this framework provides guidance and structure around those conversations and negotiations associated with the request for a tenant to have a pet at the rental property. So the owner or provider will still need to give permission to have a pet. So, but there are also provisions around the refusal process and approval um, may actually have like reasonable conditions attached. So it could be that um, the pet has to stay outside or if it's in roomy accommodation, it could be that the um, pet needs to be staying within the room um, or it could be that yeah, there's pest control to be done at the end of the tenancy. So the legislation has stated that any change, any damage caused by the pet is not considered fair wear and tear. And that's an important part to, to remember that. And the tenant is also responsible for any nuisance that it may cause, that the pet may actually cause. So there's two steps involved. The first step is the tenant and resident um, needing to seek permission and the RTA has a form to be completed to assist in that regard. Always recommend to have the details of the pet. So the size, the type, the weight, the colour, um, consider a photo or other information. And some people say, well, what would I want to do? And we've started to see as people do like pet resumes and references and, you know, um, documentation from a vet and things like that. We are not always talking about dogs and cats, and we do know that pets do come in other um, types of animals, um, fish and birds and reptiles, um, and also too that sometimes it's not a pet and that could fall into like an agricultural side of things or something like that. The second step is more about the manager or the owner needing to respond within 14 days um, and can only refuse the pet on identified reasonable grounds. So the RTA has a template letter to help respond to the request. If there's no response within 14 days, then the pet is deemed to be approved. So it's really important for managers and owners to look at these requests within that time frame and make sure that they do respond accordingly. And again, we're going to talk about a little bit on the body corporate side of things. There's usually bylaws that um, have that, whether you can have permission um, needs to be sought from the body corporate or the committee. Um, this is a separate process. So the two legislations sometimes do run parallel. And just as a side issue for that, there currently is a bill um, for parliament regarding the changes to body corporate laws. And that will include um, changes around approving pets for apartments and um, units as well. So just a side issue for that. The owners and managers just cannot just say, no, I don't want a pet. Okay, you do have to explain the reasons for the refusal. Now, under the section 184E does actually outline the reasonable grounds to refuse a pet. So it could be that it exceeds a reasonable number of animals to be kept at the property. The premises are unsuitable. Um, it could be that the pet's likely to cause damage that could not be repaired for the cost less than what the rental bond amount is. It could also contravene a bylaw or another law, um, risk to health and safety or another person. Um, as well, you can see that, you know, pets do, as I said before, come in all shapes and sizes and types. So again, it's not always the normal pets that we're talking about with the cats and dogs. Um, if a tenant does not agree to the reasonable conditions um, that's being proposed as part of the condition um, of having the pet, or again, if the animal is not a pet. So again, we're talking about like a farm animal or that's not a domestic animal. So keep in mind that a manager or owner cannot ask the tenant to pay for a pet bond, nor can they increase the rent to allow for that pet. And just also to a reminder for working dogs, um, they don't require a manager's or owner's approval. So since the changes, we've been asked a lot of questions around companion pets. So unless they are listed under the working dogs in the legislation, which is your guide, hearing and assistance dogs, your um, corrective services or your police powers, um, if they're not in under those legislation, then they still actually do require permission as such. 
So again, um, Mark, I might just get you to put a link um, in our chat for everyone today. There's a flow chart for the pet approval process, fact sheets and the form to request the pet and also the response template that you can find on our website. And again, other resources that we do have there on this particular process. Now, Sam, I'll get you to come back in because with the um, pet side of it, we had some common questions that were actually asked through, um, you know, in relation to like the legislation, you know, whether it aligns with Queensland or federal laws. And obviously this is a little bit beyond what we're doing here today. But mm -hmm. someone has actually asked, is a rat an assistant? Can a rat be an assistant animal? And I know like, like we talk, we can talk about mice and guinea pigs that we know as pets, but I suppose there's a question there, is this borderline of being a pet or is this like more on the vermin side of it? So, yeah, and what it's if, interesting. yeah. Um, it, it's interesting, I suppose, you know, there, there are many different, um, you know, definitions of, uh, of pets, essentially. Um, I mean, if you, are you talking about a rat as an assistance animal um, or support animal or something like that? Um, if it was being provided in that way as a support animal, I would expect it to come with some significant uh, documentation. Um, we don't sort of, you know, we don't determine what is and isn't a pet. There are definitions um, available. There's information on our website uh, around that kind of information. But um, I think keep in mind um, that if you are, you know, saying no to, to keeping a pet as an owner or as an agent, that you are explaining why that is. Um, and also be aware that there is dispute resolution available through the RTA. Um, so if it's a situation that you're a little bit maybe uncertain of um, and you know, maybe your relationship's not great, consider dispute resolution through the RTA. Um, and then there's always the opportunity for, uh, for QCAT to make a final ruling. And thanks, Sam. And there's also some questions there like about special terms, you know, if approving the pet, you know, can I say, can I keep it outside? Can I put some restrictions in place as part of that approval? Yep. Yeah. So as I said, I think that the big thing that we actually found, and we did a webinar um, uh, several months ago now about the common questions that we've um, been seeing um, around like the pets and things like that, um, that you'll find the recording on our website. So, and a lot of it did actually come around like what is a companion animal versus an assisted animal and, and things like that. And as you said, it's really important to have that documentation to support that. So when you are actually applying for um, approval that you do actually have some of that documentation as well. Yeah, and we'll always encourage uh, communication, obviously, between the parties. Um, so talking through what the actual issue might be um, and trying to uh, to seek a way forward uh, rather than just a flat no, which is, uh, as you've said, is, um, is not acceptable under the legislation. Yeah. Have we seen a lot of disputes come through about pets, Sam? Um, we we do get disputes around pets. I wouldn't say that they're you know it's our um, largest uh, dispute by any uh, any means, but it's obviously um, an important uh, issue for Queenslanders renting. Um, and so you know it can be there can be passion involved in that. We do find that a lot of our disputes um, come through dispute resolution, and that's often enough to resolve the situation one way or another. So it's why I really recommend um, talking talking it through with each other. Great. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so the other change was around ending a tenancy. Um, so this is where the without grounds provision was removed and additional grounds were actually added in to end a tenancy. So another section um, implemented was that if the owner or the manager ends the tenancy due to a change of use, so change of use might be uh, maybe changing it from a permanent rental into a um, short stay. Um, it could be that there's also to the sale of the rental property or if the owner or their immediate family are moving back into the property. So the premises cannot be relet for a um, six-month period. So this came with penalty provisions. And again, it would be up to the owner or the manager to provide evidence as to why this didn't occur if there was an investigation. So the legislation also stated it was an offence to provide false and misleading information in a notice requiring the tenant to vacate. And again, penalty provisions um, also applying in that regard. So just to summarise some of these grounds that came in in 2022. So the additional grounds um, included the end of a fixed term tenancy. 
Um, undertaking significant repairs, renovation, change of use, owner moving back in, preparing to sell or sale of the property and also to the properties required for state government program. So that could be where, um, yeah, there might be a new train line or a road extension going through. So for tenants, the additional grounds included that the property is not in good repair or meeting minimum housing standards when they come through, which is now in 2023. Um, it was also the death of a co-tenant. So we had previously had the death of a sole tenant, and this is actually adding now that's in place for the co-tenant. Um, no longer a student, and I'll talk about student accommodation because I know we have some um, student providers in today's session. Um, owner does not comply with a repair order or misrepresentation by the owner, and that would need to be applying within the first three months um, if that was the case with QCAP. Uh, remember, there are also still the other ways the tenancy can end. So, you know, um, not rectifying a remedy breach, um, mutual agreement. And again, those would actually have to be in writing and agreed by both parties. Um, going to QCAT if it's an urgent application. Non-livability. So some of these other reasons that have been in for a while are still in place. So the main change here with these ones was that that without grounds provision was removed. There's also some additional sections. Um, applying due to uh, terminate because of a significant breach. Um, and this was meaning that if the premises was used for illegal activities or significantly damaging the property or endangering another person. Um, just keep in mind too, for community housing um, providers, their section 290A, which is very similar, actually still does apply. Um, also too, if there was repeated breaches, um, a repeated breach of like a bylaw or a park rule was actually added into the repeated breach section as well. And two, there was also um, a section we added about retaliation where a tenant can apply to QCAT if they believe that the action from the owner or the manager is due to the tenant upholding their rights. So just want to touch on student accommodation or if so, if you are owning or managing student accommodation, and this is where the premises are primarily used for student accommodation. And if the tenant or the resident stops being a student, then um, either the provider or the manager or the tenant or the resident can give notice to end the tenancy and it's one month's notice is required. So the legislation outline, out, does outline what a student is. And remember, in these situations, this is not a lease break situation here. So some of the questions we've been asked around this particular topic is, well, can I ask for evidence if the student comes to me and says, well, you know, I'm no longer a student? Well, the answer is yes, you can ask for like supporting documentation demonstrating that they're no longer a student. So there obviously could be that their, their course has ended or that they've had um, they've had to leave um, for whatever reason and they're no longer continuing with their studies. So again, the legislation does outline what is a student as such and if they no longer are a student, they, they can actually give notice and end their tenancy if it is primarily used for student accommodation. So the full list of reasons to end a tenancy, fact sheets, the forms that um, to end a tenancy, all that information is on our website. Um, the resources are there to help you navigate how an, a tenancy can end. Um, so it's not just the notices, but also some helpful checklists as well. Mark, I might get you to um, throw that into the chat if that's okay. And Sam, I might get you to come back on. Um, the questions we received um, that were submitted through when we got registrations were all around the ending of the tenancy. But we also had things that were actually addressed with not just ending the tenancy, but the tenant damage and how to address this. So we know that we've just covered off on how a tenancy ends, mm -hmm. but also to keep in mind like that mutual agreement is still also available. But as for ten damage, Sam, I know it's not really part of today's topic, but there's obviously opportunities to claim damage on for repairs on the bond, and there's also probably landlord's insurance. What's your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, if there's damage to the property, the, the tenant um, leaving the property uh, has a responsibility to return it in as close to the original condition as when they first moved in as possible, fair wear and tear accepted. Um, now, we always get the the question on what constitutes fair wear and tear. Um, ultimately, it's the the normal sort of use of the of the property without doing anything, I suppose, outside of the the ordinary, which would cause damage. Um, it is it is a broad 
definition. Um, ultimately, you know, you'll find that a lot of tenant feels that uh, you know, they might say that what they've done is fair wear and tear, and a lot of agents or owners will say that, no, we consider that to be damage. It's why our dispute resolution service uh, exists. So there's the ability to um, claim money from the bond, have it uh, as a dispute if you can't reach an agreement, and again, ultimately with uh, with QCAT as the final decision maker if needed. Right. Now, I'll just take a couple of questions here from the chat, and and that was like, how much notice if an owner wants to move back into the property? Yeah. So there is a, there is a reason, um, an available reason to end a tenancy for that purpose, you know, for the for the owner or immediate family to move back into the property. Um, however, as um, you know, as the, the questions that have come through there, it can't be used to end an agreement early. So if you've got a fixed term agreement, you can't just uh, decide that, you know, in a month's time, you want to move back in when there's six months left on the tenancy agreement. Those kinds of situations, if you really did need to, to move into the property straight away, there's the ability to go through to QCAT. So you go straight to QCAT and uh, you're essentially asking them to end the agreement on the grounds of excessive hardship. So you'd need to demonstrate that you would be suffering excessive hardship if the agreement were not ended. And that also goes, um, Elaine's just asking as well, um, sorry about ending mm. uh, the properties um, being sold or being able to be put on the market. It's a fixed term. So same thing again, just because you're trying to um, look at ending the tenancy, it, if it's a fixed term, it's a fixed term, isn't it? Yeah. So you can see, um, you can see up on the the screen currently there are notice periods there. If you need to have a, a closer look, that information is on our website. I think Mark um, sent through a, a link in the chat. chat. Yeah. Um, so it's a two month time frame, but that's two months before the fixed term agreement ends. As I said, if you needed to uh, to end a fixed term agreement earlier, QCAT is your is your primary option. Um, unless you can negotiate directly with the tenant. So as Lynn said, there's always the ability to end an agreement through mutual agreement. Um, but outside of that, you would need to uh, to get QCAT to make that ruling. Yeah, great. All right, well, we'll keep moving along. We're going to talk about repair orders. Now, repair orders were added as, as an additional pathway for tents to have repairs carried out. Now, one of the topics that we know in the RTA, in our dispute resolution area and our call centre, that's a popular topic, is always about repairs. Um, a tenant can apply to the tribunal for an order on an urgent or non-urgent repair, and a copy is then sent to the RTA. So it's really important to note that a repair order is also attached to the rental property. And should there be a change of owners, um, say that the um, the property has been sold or that there's a change of property managers going from one agency to another, then the repair order actually still does continue until it's complied with. Now, if an owner does require um, more time to... Um, complete a repair order. So say they might be like um, something significant, there's a shortage of tradespeople. Again, this is where they would actually need to seek an extension of time. However, they do need to apply um, to QCAT prior to the expiry date of that order. So there are penalty provisions under the Tenancy Law to contravene a repair order and any outstanding repair orders must be disclosed to a prospective tenant and also to note it on the proposed tenancy agreement. So again, it's an additional pathway um, to actually get repairs done, but we'd always recommend talking to each other if you need more time to get something fixed or consider even like a compensation or rate reduction until an item actually is fixed if it is um, a significant item that's impacting that tenancy as well. Now the legislation says in granting an order that the tribunal must consider the conduct or all of the owner or the agent, um, the risk of injury, the loss of amenity and any other matter that the tribunal may consider relevant. And when they do make their directions about the repairs, if they could say if the premises are vacant, they could make an order that the premises can't be occupied until the repairs are completed. Um, it could be that the repair order may include what is or what's not going to be repaired and by when and, and what date. 
Um, it could also be a reduction in rent or compensation, as I said before, um, or that the tribunal could order that the agreement ends if the repairs are not done by a certain date. So repair orders are just one channel that also supports minimum housing standards, and we'll talk about minimum housing standards shortly. So again, the Act outlines um, emergency repairs and also what's a routine repair. So for emergency repairs, it's really important for tenants to know who to contact should there be a burst pipe, storm, flooding situations, or an item or problem where that there's security or safety issues for them and the rental property. So not all emergency repairs um, will happen during business hours. So again, really important that there's contact details on your tenancy agreement um, for those after hours emergency repairs. So the lessor provider have general obligations under the legislation and that is to ensure the premises are fit for the tenant to live in, clean and not any breach of any health and safety laws. And while the tenancy continues, they must maintain the premises and doing those repairs. So to carry out repairs, the owner or manager must give notice for entry. So a Form 9 is available from the RTA's website and give a minimum of 24 hours notice. Now, it can be that you can have mutual agreement to enter. And I know that one of the questions that's come through is about that time frame and that process. And yes, you can do that. If the tenant says, nope, no problems, come in this afternoon, I'll be at home or I won't be at home, but use the key. You just need to probably, as a best practice, probably just documenting that as well. So on our website, and I'll get Mark to put a link in if he hasn't already done so, is the fact sheets and videos on repairs, um, as well as the repair orders and, and what that actually means. So our fact sheets are there for tenants as well as for our property managers and owners as well. And you might find that that's um, quite helpful information um, and also to the process in relation to if a repair is not done. Okay, just some other amendments quickly here is that there was an increase from the two weeks to four weeks for the cost of an emergency repair where a tenant can carry out that emergency repair and it's now equivalent to four weeks rent and seek reimbursement. So remember emergency repairs are outlined under the legislation, but there's still a process where a tenant should be able to attempt to contact the owner or the manager or the nominated tradesperson that's on their agreement. Now, if there's no response, this is when obviously this part of the section comes in and they can organise those repairs to be done. There was also too that the lessor's agent can um, may arrange for emergency repairs to be made. Now the meaning that is that the managers will be able to authorise those emergency repairs on behalf of an owner client up to equivalent of those four weeks rent and make deductions from the rent payments um, before they actually disperse the funds. So for property managers who are attending today, you should also make sure that you are compliant, obviously, with the OFT, the Office of Fair Trading Rules, um, with regards to your managing agreements um, with your landlord clients. We're not here to give you legal advice in that regard, um, but just making sure that they also understand the rules that obviously are in place as well. And keep in mind, too, that your tense agreement must state a nominator repair for emergency repairs. Um, questions that we were asked last year was, well, can we actually have our agency details down? Well, that's fine, providing you're still available at two in the morning when there's a burst pipe um, and that you can actually provide assistance um, and organising that repair to occur if that be the case. Um, the other part that also was changed was some bond management tweaks that were made, um, but also two changes for Section 136D. Now, the tribunal may make an order about a rental bond payment having regard to the efforts made by the tenant to comply with the tenant's obligations under Section 188.4. Now, for 188.4, this is the tenant's obligation is to return the property in the same condition it was at the start of the tenancy, less fair wear and tear. So nothing's changed in that regard. That obligation is still in place. The tribunal can also look at the lessor and tenant's compliance with the Act and evidence supporting any claim. So this is really important. Um, we know that at the RTA, like about half of our disputes that we receive are bond-related disputes. So it's so important to have the documentation and the evidence at the start of the tenancy and the end of the tenancy. So the entry condition report, your exit reports are completed, taking photos as further evidence supporting what the property condition was like at the start and also what it's like at the end. Tenants now have seven days to return the entry condition report at the start of the tenancy, not the three days. 
and nothing's changed in relation to the exiting side of it, meaning that the tenant needs to complete the exit condition report when they hand back the keys and the manager then has three business days to return a copy to their forwarding address. So I cannot, again, stress enough the importance of that really good documentation and communication as well, um, just so that you can actually avoid those bond disputes. Now, Mark, I'm going to get you to come in and actually hopefully you've been able to summarise. I've seen the chat function go up and down with everyone's putting um, questions in. So I'll get you to um, have a look at those if that's okay. Yeah, and thanks, Sam. Lynn. So just having a look through, um, there was a couple of questions from Jenny uh, around uh, pets. Um, so what happens when the owner says no to a pet and the pet is still kept at the premises? And can we ask for documentation in relation to assistance dogs? And then a follow-up to that was obviously what can they do if they fail to supply documentation? Sam. All right. Uh, so I'll kick off on those. Um, so the first part around um, the request for a pet, um, the request it comes through and the owner says no, um, so the pet's not, uh, not been approved. Um, sounds like they're just keeping the keeping the animal anyway, even though they haven't got permission, rather than going through dispute resolution or going through to QCAT, for instance. Uh, if they've received a no and they haven't questioned it through dispute resolution or anything like that, then it's a breach. Um, it's the same as if they hadn't asked for permission, essentially. They, they've got a pet in the property that's not been approved. You can issue a breach notice and follow that uh, that normal process. Um, with regards to the um, requesting information uh, around an assistance animal, um, those kinds of things, I would think that that's perfectly normal. I don't think it's necessarily covered in the legislation explicitly, um, but uh, you can, as Lynn had said earlier, you can put in certain uh, requirements uh, around um, pets in the property. And if it is an assistance animal, I would expect that there would be um, supporting documentation with that. Thanks for that, Sam. Um, one other question from Nikita uh, with emergency repairs. Who is the invoice sent to and how can we recover costs from tenant in the event the repairs were not deemed an emergency? Hmm. Uh, so I mean, ultimately it sounds like you, if you're not agreeing that the repair was an emergency repair, uh, it can come through dispute resolution um, and that's probably the appropriate place it can go through to QCAT if needed. Um, as for who gets the invoice or where that gets sent to, I mean, ultimately, if the tenant is carrying out the repairs, they can send the invoice to whoever they're uh, renting through. Essentially, if there's an agent, they can send it to the agent. If there's an owner that they rent from directly, they can send it to them um, and then come through dispute resolution if you don't agree. Excellent. And one other question that we've seen from Rachel, if tenants do not provide a 14A, is there an obligation on the agent to complete one? So entry condition report. Um, so ultimately... Exit. Exit, uh, exit condition, condition report. report. Sorry. Yeah. So the entry <laughs> condition report is, um, is mandatory. The exit condition report is not. Um, it's, it's a really good piece of evidence to demonstrate how the property was and comparing it to the entry condition report at the start. Um, it's not an obligation to fill out the exit condition report, but it is a really good practice. And I think too, if you did have a claim and you went to QCAT and there were some issues, I think it's probably best to actually probably have one, wouldn't it? Oh, I think it's absolutely best practice, um, but yeah, it's not, uh, it's not um, an offence not, uh, not to complete one or anything like that. All right. Thanks, Mark. We'll um, keep going along. I'm just conscious of um, some time here. We've still got some slides to go on some topics, so we'll be as speedy as we possibly can so that we can make sure that we get to everyone's um, questions as well. So minimum housing standards started on 1 September for new tenancies, and this is where new agreements, rooming agreements or tenancy agreements are signed, and for all tenancies will commence from 1 September next year in 2024. Rental properties need to be safe, secure, and reasonable functionality. So let's have a look through what does safe and secure means, weatherproof and structurally sound. So your roof and windows need to be, um, prevent water entering, 
and that your floors and your walls and your roofs and decks and stairs are not likely to collapse due to rot or a defect. Um, you also have like supporting structures, you know, shouldn't be have significant dampness or not likely to cause damage to um, occupants' personal properties. Now, fixtures and fittings need to be in good repair, including any electrical items and not cause any injury. The property needs to be free of vermin, damp and mould. However, it doesn't apply if the um, this is actually caused by the tenant. Now, I'm going to talk about mould is being one of the most popular topics that we've actually had in relation to minimum housing standards. So I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, the other part is the functioning lock or latch is fitted to all external windows and doors to secure the premises against an unauthorised entry. So it applies to doors and windows, uh, does apply, sorry, doesn't apply um, if you require a ladder to access. So again, the purpose on this one is to ensure that the premises are secure. And I know we're going to get a lot of questions about, or oh, do I have to put a lock on every single window? No, it just talks about a functioning lock or a fun functioning latch. So keep that in mind. Privacy coverings. This is for windows um, in all rooms where the tenant would expect privacy. So this is like your bedrooms and bathrooms. This could be a curtain, a blind or frosting. Um, it doesn't apply if that window is obstructed by a fence or a hedge or a tree. Now let's talk about mould. It's one of those, as I said before, a popular topic. So we are always asked when it comes to mould, who, who cleans it, who, de who deals with it. So you have to ask the question of what, when, why and how. These, quest these are the questions you have to answer. So if mould is a health and safety concern, it does need to be addressed, but whether that is actually by the owner or the manager or whether it's by the tenant. And that's by asking those questions on how it got there in the first place. So if it's not clear, <clears throat> excuse me, if it's not clear on how the mould got there in the first place, then potentially you're looking at an inspection by an external professional or maybe someone with experience that may be able to assist you. So again, if we're talking like a leaking ceiling, a leaking shower, yeah, their structural items, are there, they clearly fall to the owner. If we are talking about mould in the bathroom because someone didn't put the exhaust fan on, um, clearly that's going to be falling through to the tenant to rectify. And we know that some of the grey areas are around sometimes the environment and that sometimes is a negotiation. But look, there's many products available out there to remove mould and, yes, you can search on the internet. Um, we're not the mould experts, um, but over time we've learned a lot of lessons about mould um, and know that some products will discolour the mould versus removing the mould spores and hence why if you don't remove the spores, the mould comes back. So please do do yourself, um, please do research um, and ensure that the product or service that you have is right and, and does fit your individual situation with the rental property. So besides um, safe and secure, the premises needs to have reasonable functionality. So the premises must have adequate plumbing and drainage um, for the number of people occupying the premises and be connected to a water supply or infrastructure supplying hot and cold water suitable for drinking. Your bathroom and toilet facilities must provide privacy and function as design, and they must be connected to a sewer septic or other waste disposal system. Now, if included, a um, kitchen must have a functioning cooktop and your laundry must include fixtures required to provide a functional laundry. Now, one of the questions we're getting asked to is, what happens if the tent believes that the rental property does not meet minimum housing standards? And then there are several options is what you can see on your slide there. So in the first instance, the RTA is always going to recommend self-resolution. You know, so both the tenant, the owner and the managers talking with each other and trying to resolve the matter and work out a solution. So again, communication is the key to resolving a lot of the tenancy disputes that we see, and we know that it can work. So however, if we look at the slide, we've got the option of, if the tenants just moved in and the property doesn't meet minimum housing standards, they could give notice and move out in the first seven days of occupancy. Um, they still do need to give notice, by the way, for that one. Um, if applicable, the tenant can apply for termination order at QCAT, on the grounds of misrepresentation. Um, that has to be done within the first three months. Um, option three is the tenant requests emergency repairs to the premises. Option four is the tenant applies for free dispute resolution service through the RTA about getting repairs done to the property. 
And option five is the tenant makes an urgent application to QCAT for a repair order. And just touching again on the body corporate side of things for pets, repairs and minimum housing standards. You've got your complexes that will have bylaws about window coverings. You could have also too about repairs, working out whether it's the owner's responsibility or whether it might actually fall to the body corporate. So roof and external walls and even some, in, some of the internal piping may fall to the body corporate rather than the actual owner. So you need to look at the timeframes. Body corporates um, need to take that action and or committees, they whether it falls within their spending limit or not. We have done a couple of webinars with the commissioner's office. Um, they're available on our website and a really great um, resource. If you happen to manage or live in a body corporate situation, then again, please have a look at those resources. And I, Mark, I might get you to put a couple of links in uh, the chat if that's okay. Now, the other changes that came through um, this year was the changes um, where we it's been limited to the rent increase frequency to be not every six months, but to be changed to be once a tw every 12 months. So these amendments do bring Queensland into line with other Australian jurisdictions. So it does not limit the rent increase amount, but it applies to existing and new tenancies. And this came in as of 1 July. So they're also retrospective, meaning that if you had an existing lease in place and you had increases that said six months, well, no, it actually have to be the 12 months. The 12 month minimum period um, is since the last increase or when the rent was payable. And it applies where at least one tenant's right to occupy the property continues and whether or not there's been a change of the owner or the change of a property manager. So we do have videos and fact sheets and also to a list of frequently asked questions on our website covering this particular topic. Now, if you fell into the exemption part, which under the legislation was like if the lesser was a state, or if you fell into the other reasons for the exemption, then you would still continue to get the exemption. But if you didn't have the exemption previously, then the new rules or the current rules now for the 12 months will actually apply to you. Again, uh, we do actually have some examples on our website for rent increases, um, just to try and help you have a better understanding about when the ring increases can occur and when it cannot occur. Legislation still remains the same when it comes to a tenant wishing to dispute the pro uh, a proposed rent increase. If they do feel that it's excessive, they can actually make an application to QCAT. They do come through the RTA's dispute resolution service first and must do so within 30 days of receiving the notification. If it does go to QCAT, the adjudicator is going to look at the range of market rents used to charge for compatible properties, the increase compared to the current rent, the state of repair, the term of the tenancy, and literally anything else that the tribunal might consider relevant. So there is more information again on our website on this, but also too, we do publish median rent data across the whole of Queensland for various types of properties. So you can actually search your postcode area and your type of property and actually um, check out what the median rent data is for that particular type of property in your location. We publish this every quarter um, and it also then you can also look back um, throughout the year as well as past years and see how the market has been for your type of property. Now, just on the rent increase um, back in July, there was a further um, announcement made where the Queensland Government um, did a consultation on the frequency um, with the objective of the reform and to ensure that the annual rent increase limit operates effectively and to help stabilise the rent in the private market. So the Queensland Government sought the feedback um, and it was about proposing the increase to be attached to the rental property uh, rather than individual tenancies. Now, there was a discussion paper that was released by the government. Consultation closed back in August. So we are waiting for further updates from the Department of Housing with regards to the outcome of that consultation. So once we do know more, we will also let you know. So many of you would also be aware of the announcement of stage two of the rental reform. So the government produced an options paper, sought feedback, this closed back in May. There's five key legislative reform priorities that was listed in the options paper. So the installation of modifications and making personal, personalised personalization changes, sorry. Now, 
you probably would have known that that was probably part of um, the stage one, but just didn't quite make it into the amendments then. So they've actually been looking at it now for stage two. The balancing privacy and access, improving the rental bond process and fairer fees and charges. Now the link um, I have on the slide there, I'll get Mark to also put that into the chat for you. So please um, copy that out of the chat if you want to know more about what was proposed or what has been proposed and sought feedback on. Remember, this is not law at this time of this webinar. So Department of Housing are reviewing all the feedback it's received and obviously they'll advise us in due course and we can let everybody know what will actually be coming forward um, for stage two. So there's stage, there's steps in relation to this once the option paper um, is sorted, the, you know, the developing of the reforms, it's going to be introduced into parliament, it's going to be passed in parliament, and then the stage two needs to be implemented. So there's other steps that needs to be involved here um, before it becomes legislation. And as I said before, once we know more, we will certainly be letting you and everybody else know in the sector. So I'm just conscious we have gone a little bit over time and we're going to get to your questions. But again, all our resources, you can sign up for our e-news um, and get information to your inbox. Our podcasts and our webinars are also available. Um, and also very much a lot of information there about all the changes that's happened over the last year or two as well. Now, Mark, can we kind of get you to come back on? Is there... There is a lot of questions there, I know that. Can we kind of like summarise them into like some topics and things like that and see how we go? Thank you. If you can hang on with us for a little bit longer, we'll get through a little bit more in the way of the questions. So just grouping up um, the question, uh, is there a cap on how much rent can be increased? Is the general... Okay, so um, the legislation, there's nothing in the legislation that says how much rent could be, and the RTA doesn't have a position on what constitutes uh, an excessive rent increase. Um, so there's no limit, uh, essentially. But as Lynn said, if uh, if a tenant feels that an increase is, um, is more than is reasonable, uh, there is a process for them to come through dispute resolution and go to QCAT uh, if needed. There's timeframes that can apply, but there's no cap as such. Thanks, Sam. And one last one, uh, and this is probably a little bit specific, but property owners for a uh, property managers for a building complex, one owner, nobody corporate. Mm -hmm. At the moment, house rules allow for smoking on the balcony. Are we able to amend the house rules and implement a rule that makes the whole complex a non smoking building, including okay. no vaping? So you are you are able. Um, sorry, then I'll jump in just quickly. You are able to make um, house rules about no smoking. Um, the challenge that you find is whenever you're trying to do something while there's current agreements in place. Um, but certainly, if uh, you know if everyone negotiates and and that's okay, that's fine. But um, ultimately, um, you know, you're probably looking at uh, after these agreements are finished or coming through dispute resolution. Lynn, did you I was have just gonna. Yep. Yeah, I was just going to add to that too, for anyone who is actually in the body corporate world as well, like managing units and apartments. Um, again, I mentioned previously about the bill um, being introduced into Parliament for some changes to the body corporate laws. Um, smoking actually is one of those um, that I believe might be looked at as well, um, as I think it's pets um, and towing. I think might be the other one um, just to yeah. keep an eye on that as well. But Sam, I might just come back to you. Um, there's a couple of questions that were submitted in previously um, about can the rent be increased after a break lease? Okay. Um, yeah. So as the, as the legislation stands from, uh, from when it was changed um, with the um, 12 month timeframe, so not being able to increase the, the rent any more frequently than every 12 months, um, if it's a break lease situation and everyone is out of the property and you've got brand new tenants coming in, um, then there's nothing necessarily stopping you from uh, from increasing the rent. And again, obviously it comes down because it's a new tenancy, but again, if you do increase the rent, you've got that mitigation of loss, haven't you, to make yeah. sure that you haven't um, jeopardised finding a replacement tenant. Yeah, absolutely. So you need, to, you need to do everything you can to find a new tenant as quickly as possible. You don't want to be putting anyone off because you might be impacting your own compensation claim. 
Correct. So one of the other ones that we want to just touch on base here, there's a couple, um, if we can, if everyone can just bear with us, was in relation to rent reviews with community housing providers, um, if the tenant's income changes, whether it's an increase or decrease, can the rent review be done? Okay. Um, so you mentioned a bit about uh, exemptions previously. Um, so I know when they when they're sort of income based uh, rent arrangements, they're often sort of community housing uh, providers. Those things. So the exemptions weren't uh, weren't touched when the new legislation came in. So if you were previously having to uh, only able to increase the rent every six months, that would now be every twelve months. Um, Ultimately, you can do a rent review, but you wouldn't be able to increase the rent uh, unless it had been 12 months since that amount had been uh, made payable. Yeah, as you said, really important to work out whether you've got that exemption or not the exemption. Yep. Just a couple more if that's okay, Sam. The rent increase during a fixed term and the two months notice requirement, the process for that. Yeah, so it's and you know, really good information on our website, but it's it's making sure that you're sticking to the fundamentals. So, you know, you can't increase the rent uh, more than every 12 months. You need to give two months notice to the tenant um, to let them know that the rent is going to change. So ultimately, you're looking at making sure that you're meeting those timeframes um, so that you're clear with the tenant. Tenant knows what they've got to do and you're not increasing the rent um, you know, earlier than the 12-month period. And Mark, I might come back to you. There's a couple of questions I know that's um, come into the chat. I might just get you to have yeah. a quick look at those for us. Well, while we're talking about rent increases, uh, mm. there's a question that's coming. Can rent be increased on a new tenancy after six months? Uh, it would need to be 12 months. So the key there is if the tenants are remaining or at least one of the tenants is remaining in that subsequent agreement, it needs to be 12 months. Yeah. Correct. Yep. All right. And then just... Um, and I guess this is going back, Lynn, to the um, change in the laws around uh, death of a co-tenant. If there's a death in the family of a tenant, for example, a child, is there an opportunity to break lease without penalty due to the emotional stress and trauma as their current situation has drastically changed? And that's a really good question. Thanks, Lindsay, for asking. And I suppose at the end of the day, because it, like, it is obviously a very sensitive situation, you would hope that both the tenant and the manager and the owner would actually be communicating and talking to each other. And if it wasn't allowed that the tenant could actually break the lease, then the tenant would be in a position to actually apply for hardship through QCAT. Would you agree, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, I know that we had some other questions in relation to, um, just quickly, Sam, I'll fire off a few here. <laughs> what do tenants do in room accommodation if um, it's they don't want to clean in accordance to a cleaning roster? You know, okay, what do so they do? If we've if we've got like a, an um, applicable house rule around cleaning, uh, and cleaning can be a bit subjective, but if they're clearly not doing it, well, they're not keeping the uh, the premises clean as per the agreement, they'd be in breach of the agreement. You can issue them with a breach notice. Yeah. Got quite a few questions that were submitted through about the rental reforms for stage two. And all I can say for that is like once we know more, absolutely, we will do something very similar to what we've done for the last couple of years in relation to delivering education, a variety of channels that we will do it through, webinars, podcasts, you know, our face-to-face -face events that we've done around the state, fact sheets, you name it, we'll actually be doing that. So please um, everyone just be mindful that we will actually educate, we will provide information um, about the changes when they and when they do actually come through. So not to stress about it, but once we know more, we will be passing that information on. Periodic tenancies versus fixed term leases. We know the difference, obviously, start date, end date for a fixed period of time versus a start date, no end date. Uh, someone's asked what's best. Uh, um don't think I'm allowed to have an opinion. Um, no. <laughs> but ultimately, it'll depend on the circumstances and uh, and um, what your requirements are. Potentially, what insurance requirements are. We'd encourage you to um, to do your research uh, ultimately and make sure that whatever agreement you're putting in place um, suits your particular needs. Yeah, great. And look, if we haven't been able to quite get to your um, question that you. Um, submitted earlier we will actually go back through and actually have a look at those because um, we'll actually have your details our website has a lot of information and resources available to help you navigate those tenancy laws and processes 
our contact centre, the fantastic staff in our contact centre is available Monday to Friday um, to help you out on the 1300 366 311 number. There will be a quick survey that's going to come up at the end of the webinar. We'd really appreciate you completing it. it takes either 10 seconds or one minute, however, whatever one you'd like to go for. It's a very short question and we'd love to also hear what topics you'd like to know more about. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Mark, for your assistance today. Thank you for attending the webinar.